All right, we're going to go through some theory today, and this slideshow uh, is on the homepage of Inside Rankin uh, here, which is labeled Authentication. And so, um, kind of the whole topic around today is logins. Now, you know, I think as we get into authentication, one of the first things that we'll see is that there are more advanced forms of authentication besides username and password. Um, but look, I mean, what's accepted primarily across the internet? Username and password. Um, and so, yeah, we'll cover some theory about how other ways you can implement authentication. Um, but as part of authentication, uh, we're going to talk about uh, what is a cookie. And I don't know that maybe in JavaScript, like when you guys had the vanilla JavaScript, maybe you touched on cookies. Um, and then JSON web tokens. And so there's, you know, kind of talked about these different pieces that are all going to come together um, to enable to enable secure authentication. Um, and so, you know, what is authentication? And I kind of have this in my lecture outline, right? So I'm reading a definition. Authentication is a process of determining whether someone or something is in fact who uh, or what it declares to be. You know, when, uh, when you authenticate yourself with the government ID, you've got your uh, driver's license or your state issued ID. You know, you are proving you are who you say you are. Uh, and that's kind of the whole form of, um, uh, that's kind of the whole purpose of your ID. So there is the definition that I just read. Authentication is a process of determining whether someone is, in fact, who or what it declares itself to be. Uh, in, in real life, we use IDs, government-issued IDs. Across the internet, we use usernames and passwords. The most common form of authentication on the internet and the World Wide Web is username and password. Um, we have login forms, which they, they're very typically coming in two forms there, username and password or email and password. And I have an opinion. Uh, it should be your email and password over a username and password. Why? Well, username is worthless information. You guys all have your usernames on Discord, and I have no idea who you are. Your usernames are just made up screen names. They're, they're meaningless. Okay, Emails obviously have a very specific purpose. Um, so when choosing between username and password or email and password opinion here, choose email and password because email is something very useful. You have someone's email, you can market to them. You can sell to them. You can, you know, send them weekly newsletters. Uh, you can bring them back to your website with, with, uh, you know, newsletter links, you know, links in your emails to come back and visit. Um, you, also can authenticate with credit cards, right? So you got your credit card number and your PIN. Um, not that long ago, they started introducing chips, which we should all have chips in our credit card numbers as well. By now, does everyone have a chip in their credit card nowadays? It's pretty much standard. Pretty much sure is, is law to do that. Um, you're buying something on the internet, of course, you're asked for the expiration date and the CVC code. Again, going back to the definition, um, what something is, right? So I guess the whole point of the credit card uh, is that, you know, this is your mode of purchasing something on the internet. Uh, so what it is, is a mode of purchase. Uh, credit card number and signature. And then, you know, to authenticate to your, I guess, to authenticate to your credit card, you need a PIN, chip, expiration date. To authenticate to your smartphone, uh, you need your pin, your pattern, your fingerprint, your facial recognition, etc. Um, so these are just different modes of authentication, whether you're authenticating to your credit card, to a website, or to a smartphone. Uh, authentication is a process or action of proving or sh showing something to be true, genuine, or valid. 
Um, authentication is the process. Okay, so you guys can read definitions, just kind of going off of definitions. Well, yes, authentication is just different definition. Uh, users are typically identified with a username uh, and passwords. So, yeah. So, how can you provide authentication? Uh, obviously, your what you know. So, we get into uh, the different uh, types or factors. You know, something you know, username and password, something you possess. And so to authenticate to our building, you possess a rank and ID card. Uh, inheritance, something you are. And so you can authenticate, as we all see in the movies, with your retina scanners um, to get into a room. You can authenticate with your location. Uh, I was in Canada not that long ago. And I was logging into my email and it noticed that I was outside of the United States and that kind of threw up a location flag like, hey, you don't, you're not typically in Canada. Uh, I'm sure you guys have seen that with your credit card. Like if someone stole your credit card and they're trying to use your credit card like outside of the United States, that's going to flag the credit card company is, is not valid. <clears throat> uh, and behavior. Uh, how you act and when thinking about behavior um, I actually saw this at the airport <laughs> um, uh, at the airport they have you know this is kind of a weird example of this but at the airport um, you know um, child trafficking is a thing right You've heard of this and you are told at the airport that if if a relationship seems unnatural, like I literally saw a sign, if a relationship between two parties seem unnatural to kind of like raise a flag and like notify someone, that if two parties are kind of behaving unnatural to, or how they're acting, um, to kind of say that that doesn't seem authentic, if you will. Right, so um, this is another form of authentication. I have another example of that. Yeah, please. Whenever a bank calls you and they talk about suspicious behavior on your account. There you go. Whenever you're like, if they see different charges coming in, they'll be like, hey, this doesn't seem normal to your spending patterns. So yeah. Just checking in. Yeah, well, you've, you've, uh, you've never bought from this website from China or whatever it may be. Um, so going back to the factors... Right, knowledge factors, username and email, password, PIN code for your credit card, social security, driver license number, you know, social security number, not super commonly used anymore. I remember, you know, a long time ago, I had to authenticate to clock in at my work with my social security number. But that's not exactly secure in 2024, right? That's considered a real sensitive piece of information. So social security number used a little bit less nowadays. If you travel abroad, of course, you need your passport number and your security questions like what you know what city was your mother born in what was your mother's main name possession factors if you ever work for the government uh you're going to see like even to authenticate to use a computer you might need a smart card like a usb type plug-in for my work i have a security token on a little key i have to put in like do my thumbprint with yeah yeah, so, you know, those are becoming more common. Um, authenticator apps. How many websites do we use nowadays that you need a, another third-party authenticator app? What authenticator apps do you all use? Microsoft. I just use the one on my phone, the Google Authenticator. The Google Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator. Yeah, Microsoft Authenticator is what I use. Microsoft. Google. Uh, One-time security codes to your email. Um, I mean, these are becoming almost tedious nowadays. Just to log into a website, you got to like authenticate like three different ways. It seems like Microsoft doesn't let me enter your password. I have to use a code every time, the email code every time. Yeah. I hate it. 
Yeah. Like, like we're all, we're, we've all been there, I think. We're all a little annoyed by providing like three forms of authentication. It's not just username and password. It's and the one-time code and the authenticator app and, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. They had the car in the corner and you didn't see it because it was blurry. Yeah. Yeah, Paul. Some some companies do. I see. Yeah, some do. Um. And if it's you know old technology, probably the government. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of the thing there. Again, going to inheritance, just a different factor, a different kind of factor. Uh, fingerprint scanners, which the old joke was like if you had a gummy bear, you could stick the gummy bear on your finger and then put it on the fingerprint reader and that would get you in. So fingerprint scanners, uh, more securely would be the retina scanners. My daughter watches... Uh, what was that movie with uh, The Incredibles? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Edna and she. Yeah. Okay. Moving on. Facial recognition, voice recognition. Re uh, uh, Edna had all four of these <laughs> to enter her room. <laughs> Again, location factors. Where are you? Uh, and both of these uh, IP addresses and GPS coordinates can be acquired uh, from... Uh, your internet provider, your ISP. And again, you kind of see the architecture of the internet um, is uh, dispersed enough that your routers are giving unique IP addresses and those IP addresses uh, say, well, you're in Canada or you're in Mexico or you're, where in the world are you? Um, so that's a location factor. And oh, here's your favorite, the behavior factor. Right, uh, the 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 recaptchas. Um, so here you go. How you act, and it's like selecting the crosswalks, and so you act as a human. Although, I'm sure these, with uh, machine learning, machines can learn what are crosswalk, what are crosswalk walks, uh, pretty well nowadays. Um, so what we will be implementing, of course, is username and password, right? So all of this to say, these are all different forms. Um, and then what do you do? You know, you can log in, uh, definitely can send a, uh, like if you're registering a new user with an email address, uh, send an email with a one-time, you know, verification code to you know, verify that it is in fact a valid email address. That's not a hard thing to do with uh, Node Mailer. It's just uh, an express package to send emails. Um, so yeah, that's what we will be doing is the email and password. Of course, two factors is more secure. Um, And so if you are using two factors, the recommendation there is to use different types of factors, right? So knowledge mixed with another one, possession or inheritance or location, so on and so forth, right? So two factor more secure than one. Of course, the more, uh, generally speaking, more factors greatly improve security. Okay, so once you, you know, authenticate someone, you say, okay, yes, you belong to our system. You have a valid email and password. Then it becomes, well, how long are we keeping you authenticated? Okay, and you answer that with cookies. Okay, so from the class, what do you know about cookies? Uh, internet, internet cookies, not chocolate chip, obviously, right? So what do you know about internet cookies? 
I heard, I heard, I don't know yet, and then I heard they store data. They store data. Paul? They can, right? So, um, Jamisha is spot on. You're just storing information in files. Like I almost think of a cookie as a text file. It's a really small text file. Turns out, cookies you can't store a lot of information. Okay, but storing information about users in these little files on your computer on the client's computer okay and the server like they're sent back and forth between client and server um uh, you know about the user so again if they're just storing information about the user you know one piece of information is that they've been authenticated so what you can do is the user provides you your, your server, if a user authenticates with your server, you could say, yeah, this is a valid user, and you save that information in a cookie. They have authenticated, right? Call it an authentication cookie. But even take a step back. Okay, so one thing that cookies typically store is authentication information. Like, yes, they've authenticated with my website. Um, but even kind of backing up, what is a cookie? Jamisha says it's a piece of information about the user. Uh, cookies are big business. Cookies are big business on the internet and some people nodding their head. They store information about you. They being the companies, the, the websites that you go to, they save information about you so that then they can sell that. They can personalize your experience. And they can, per AKA Facebook, yeah. right? If you've ever heard this before, you know, on Facebook, what are they selling? You know, what is the product on Facebook? The answer is you, right? If you've never heard that before, that's, that's kind of what Facebook is selling. Okay, is Facebook free? Well, you pay for it with your information, right? You are the product on Facebook. What's the thing that you, you even said this? Um, information is a new oil. Information is a new oil, right? And so, yeah, I've definitely said that before, but certainly not original to it, but like, uh, the most valuable commodity. Like it used to be oil is the world's most valuable commodity. And nowadays you say information is the most valuable commodity. Uh, uh, data is the most valuable commodity. More valuable than oil. And if you don't believe me, it used to be oils are the world's most valuable oil companies. You know, what are the oil companies like Shell and BP? These used to be called in the 90s the world's most valuable companies. Okay, today, what's the world's most valuable companies? They're all tech. Meta. Meta. And what is Meta's product? You. And what, what does Meta sell about you? Where you live, what you like, who you date, what you search. What you search. You know, now the speculation is that Meta is listening to your conversations when you're not even using it okay and uh there's a i listen to very smart tech people on a regular basis and i'd put it a five percent chance that some sort of security vulnerability there was a big whatsapp anybody use whatsapp whatsapp was actually had a notorious leak for that that where the, whatsapp was listening to you um Maybe listening to me right now. You got WhatsApp on your phone? <laughs> no, <laughs> Throw it out the window. Right. If you if you give it that voice recognition, but what I'm saying is different. Is what I'm saying is that the app, when your phone is turned off, when your phone is sleeping, uh -huh. that it's still recording in the background. That's what I'm talking about. And WhatsApp had a known security leak where WhatsApp was listening to you when your phone screen was off. Okay, now, Ivan, uh, modern, especially Apple, Apple's known for security, okay? And I'm an Android person, okay? I'm an Android person, I have always owned Android, but I give props to Apple that to get an app on Apple, they have a very strict process. approval process. That's right. That's right. 
Um, but there's been some what I would what I understand to be backdoor kind of hidden stuff. Anyways, point is, but let's get back. Let's get back on topic. What are cookies? Cookies are files, and they save information about the user. And that can be whatever information you want. Your username, your location, whatever information the website can get about you. What browser you're using, what operating system you're using, whatever that. And then what can companies do? They can save that information and then they can sell it. So cookies are big business because they collect information about their users and then they sell that off to the marketing companies. They sell it to you know, Burger King and they sell it to whatever. You go, you go to Facebook and there are companies that will pay to market to a certain kind of person. Okay, anybody ever buy a Facebook ad before? I've bought a Facebook ad. I wanted to, I wanted to, uh, have, I, I do a couch to 5k program. Okay. Couch to 5k where you exercise from the couch, no exercise to where you run a 5k. And I wanted to target a certain kind of person. So on Facebook, I bought an ad where I got to say, well, I want someone who lives in the Belleville area. So again, if they know where you are, they save that information about you. Um, who's interested in being active. So I could say what their interests were and how do they know what your interests are? Well, they're again, they're saving your search history. Looking at your likes. They're looking at your likes. They're looking at your search history, right? Exactly. So you can pinpoint the kind of person that you want to market to because they're saving information about you in the form of cookies, then they can say, okay, well, I'm going to send it to this person and not market to that kind of person. So um, cookies are how, it's like the, the first level of how data can persist. Okay, now as I move into this, HTTP is stateless. You've You've heard me joke about this before. I've called, you know, like a, like a one night stand, a client server relationship. They kind of forget about each other. You know, the client says, give me a resource. The server responds with something and then they forget about each other. So HTTP, the protocol of the internet, right? Without, without HTTP, there's no, you know, communication on the internet uh, for, uh, well, excuse me. There's no World Wide web, right? requesting web pages okay there's many protocols of the internet http is one of them okay so the server doesn't remember anything about any any client requests the server doesn't track anything about the user every request is treated as independent every request must be self-contained requests can be made and processed in any order so basically stateless means that the server forgets about the client after and cookies is how we begin to change that. It's how we begin to remember who is the client. The server can now remember who is the client through this use of cookies. Okay, and one kind of cookie makes what's called the session. Okay, sessions have cookies. And sessions are browser windows that when you can go from page to page to page, like that would be three different HTTP requests on the same website. And if you're not saving information, if you're not saving any cookies, going from page to page to page, you can't save any information like cart information, right? You got a shopping cart and you're adding items to your cart. You're going from one page to the next page. Like it would forget about you. You couldn't save information in a cart, you know, in a shopping cart if all you had was HTTP. Okay. So this is actually a good thing, HTTP is stateless, because it's really good for uh, performance, but it makes it hard to deal with users. Again, when we talk about cookies, we have uh, uh, authentication cookies, auth cookies. Okay, so we can remember who you are, logins and, and authorization. So um, HTTP being stateless is good for performance, but kind of makes some challenges when dealing with certain things, okay? So here, cookies are how we begin to make your apps stateful. 
uh, little bits of data stored on the client. So, you know, here I am on, on Chrome and you guys have done this. You can go into your settings and delete your cookies. Okay, now the server generates the cookie and sends it to the client. I, I you know, the, the cookie is created in Express. We're gonna create cookies in Express and send it to the client. So the cookies are stored on the client, but they're created on the server. Yes. Um, your passwords will just remain in the database. Oh, yeah. Um, so that that is also, that's, yeah. So your question is autofill. The answer to your question, if you're looking at uh, MDN, is in HTML, um, ba, 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 autocomplete. So, the question is, hey, I'm on a website and it's it's filling in my password for me. Um, and that's that's done. I think I think the answer is yes, that is done with more of a permanent cookie. Um, but this one is purely in the browser. I I don't know that this is domain specific. Normally cookies are domain specific meaning your website uh, and uh, it, it's unique. But the autocomplete's a little bit different because it's actually, you can go into your Chrome settings and you can see all of your autocomplete values, right, in your Chrome settings. So that, that one's a little bit unique. Um, that's a good question. Um, and I would encourage you guys to uh, MDN, autocomplete um, all the different you can autocomplete your first name your family name of course your email um, and again these values are just saved in the browser but they're not really domain specific there's a lot of different autocompletes um, your shipping address, your street address, your billing, your postal code, all that fun stuff. That's that's really just HTML. I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. The problem with cookies, even though cookies are great, cookies are big business and they save information and cookies are wonderful, the problem with cookies is that they're not encrypted. Okay, so if you're sending data back and forth between the client and the server and man in the middle intercepts your data, uh, that's a problem. Now, you're, you're not, again, going back to Jamisha, you're not like sending your username and password back and forth, but there might be sensitive information that you're sending back and forth between uh, client and server. Again, cookies, this bullet's important. Cookies are automatically sent back to the server with every request. So cookies are just back and forth. They're communicated back and forth every time between the client and the server. Okay, they're generated on the server, they get sent to the client, and then the client sends that cookie back to the server. Again, that's how they remember one another with these things called sessions. Um, but they're plain text, they're not encrypted, that's where we're going to introduce JWT. Okay, JWT is how we're just going to encrypt the information going back and forth, including our authentication cookie. <clears throat> okay, and it says they are readable and modifiable by the, the cookie. Check this out. So if you guys don't have this extension, Go ahead, if you guys use Chrome, download this, this extension because we'll use it in this class. Okay, this is a Chrome extension called Edit This Cookie. Okay, and there's a lot going on here that we don't have to worry about right now. But this is a useful extension that this bullet right here reminded me of. It says, these cookies are readable by browser extensions. And so go ahead, check out this extension, 
install it. Okay, and each cookie has a few properties such as a domain name, what is your website? An important thing about cookies is that they don't last forever. How long should cookies last is my question to the class. Yeah. How long do you think a cookie should last? Because at what point does the last session interfere with future sessions when you are saving the cookie? Yeah, yeah. Um, Thoughts? What do you think? I think it kind of is case by case. I think I think you're right. Yeah. What do you think, Paul? I was gonna say maybe they get like mutated every request or something about dangerous. Extended, maybe. Like yeah. Um, maybe they last until the next. Which is, it can be true. You can update. You can up, update the expiration date. Because isn't that where like timeout comes in? Yeah, I mean, you could time out like a, yeah, your cookie would expire after a certain amount of time, but that, that you could change that if you, you know, if you're using your, you know, authentication cookie, you can extend Does that. It last until like the next session by a single user. So it like, it Indefinitely? Like preserves, it, it, so like it preserves their information until the next time they're on the board, then like re-preserves their information. It could. So if, um, the, the, the conf conversation is, can it just last until they come back to the website? And if you think of a social media, like a Facebook, that's what they do, right? Facebook's not gonna log you out, right? Why would Facebook log you out? That's like another layer of like, not using our website. If you can't remember your username and password, now you can't use Facebook. The whole purpose of social media is to be used as much as they can get your addicted brains to use them. Right? So why would Facebook ever want to log you out? They're just going to keep that cookie live as long as they can. Maybe, and I, I don't know if there's a limit. Uh, maybe I should Google that. I don't know that there's a limit to like, how can it last for five years? I don't know. Let me, let me Google this. How long can a cookie last? Ah. <laughs> Depends on what kind of cookie we're talking about. Apparently Facebook's cookies are two years long. Years. They can last for years. I thought it was like a few months at most. So if they're saving all that data on the client side, and these cookies can like go to like millions of people and they're getting the whole week of browsing, how does it handle all that? What are the different sites though? The question, one more time. So remember, so they're saving cookies. They can save it on the client, but they can also save some of the information on the server as well, right? So it's up to it's up to the developer to figure out what information you're saving out of the cookies. Like you could save cookie information in a database. Okay. They bounce back and forth, and they do have an expiration. Okay, and that expiration could be extended. Yeah. And and it can last for years. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can. I learned the secret of extension. Yeah. It's, it's the keep me logged in checkbox. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. So you yeah keep me logged in may, might extend the time of the cookie. Um. So again, expiration date, if you're on a social media site, they're gonna say, let's let your login cookie last for years. Obviously the other extreme besides social media would be your bank, right? Your bank, yeah, five minutes. You've been logged out for inactivity. Yeah, inactivity for five minutes, boom, get out because of obvious reasons. So a session, what you're talking about is a session. And a session, yes. So a session is just one tab going to a website. You close that tab, that cookie's deleted if it's a session cookie, okay? But there are different kinds. And so again, going back to banks, Banks are session cookies. They are, they're gonna expire if you close that tab or they're gonna expire after five minutes of inactivity, right? Very secure, right? 
TikTok never expires. Exaggeration, but you get the point. Um, banks, other extreme. And so how sensitive is your website to, you know, you probably, unless you're working for a bank, you probably just want to keep the user pretty well authenticated for a long time, you know? Uh, because again, that, that leads to easier usability in the future. Uh, so then the cookie name and the, the, the actual data in the cookie. Um, yes, Henry. So a session is a kind of a type of cookie, if you will. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so remember request and response if you're looking at my screen here this request object has a lot of information in it that we haven't talked about but remember request is what's coming from the client you can tell operating system ip address you could tell there's a lot of information kind of buried in that object yeah and so um well, how do we create cookies? Well, Express has res.cookie. Uh, so it's literally in the response object. Remember, the request comes from the client. The response is what you send back to, when you send back. And we say, hey, we're going to send back in the response. We're going to create this cookie. And we're going to call this cookie the name. So what is the name? And this is a, we're going to name this theme. And then what is the value that we're saving? Uh, the theme is dark, whatever. So I guess some websites you can have dark themes and light themes and whatever. You could, what is the username? So this could be username and put the username in there. Their, again, their IP address, whatever information you want to save. So um, what's the takeaway here? There's no dependency. There's no dependency that you have. There's no NPM I, some cookie package. Pre it's pre-built into Express. So built into Express, we can create cookies. Uh, it is done with res.cookie. Um, and then we got some options. These are optional. So your res.cookie has to, it's mandatory name, it's mandatory value. And then the brackets just signify that these are optional parameters. Okay. And such as when does it expire? Okay. So obviously we're going to be using these optional parameters to setting expiration uh, uh, dates. Uh, in GMT, that's the weirdest time. You guys familiar with GMT? Greenwich Mean Time. Isn't that considered like the universal? The universal time, if you're if you're familiar with it. Um, I think I've also heard of UTC. Uh, right. So UTC is another very simple. Yeah. Universal time coordinate or something. Yeah. So universal time, very similar to uh, Greenwich Mean Time. Turns out time as, as it exists today hasn't been around all that long. You guys know this? Time wasn't really a thing until trains were invented. Like is like the minutes. No, excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, what I'm saying is minutes and seconds. Like maybe hours and days were observed, but like getting down to like minutes and precise seconds weren't even a thing until trains were. <laughs> Time didn't exist until. 
when were trains invented, though? A couple hundred years ago? You know what I mean? 1800s? So, anyways, this whole what is GMT and UTC, it's just been around just a couple hundred years. It hasn't been around all that long. Uh, GMT is often interchanged or confused with UTC. But GMT is a time zone, and UTC is a time standard. Today I learned. Okay, so we can create cookies with res.cookie. It's built into Express. You've got required things and you've got optional things. We're going to be doing all three. And you can kind of see the, the docs here. So here's an example if I kind of zoom in. Woo. Oh, I saw a good example. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry. Here's res.cookie. Okay. Res.cookie, the name of name, the value of Toby. The domain is example.com. Secure true res.cookie. If you have a remember me cookie, I think Matt pointed that out. If they click remember me, you know, it expires in many days. Where it says path, is that like the API route? That is, that is correct. Yeah, that would be part of your route. Um, I've only only had HTTP only to true. I don't know a cookie that isn't HTTP only. I, uh, if you're talking about HTTPS, the other thing, you know, we, we will talk about like HTTPS here in a little bit. Um, now, um, one thing to remember, okay, the server sends a cookie down to the client, that cookie is saved on the client, and then it's sent back to the server. So you might want to read some information uh, out of the cookie when you're on the server. And remember, that's going to be in the request object. And it is stored in what's called the header. Remember, a request has a header, a body, and was there a third piece? A header and a body. And in the header, there's a piece of it that says, hey, the header bears uh, a, a cookie or a token, if you will. And so we will be reading cookies on the server uh, from the request object and it's going to be referred to as the in the request header uh, bearer and so it's just it's just where the the cookie is stored when it's sent from the client back to the server okay this this word bearer you're going to see that and that just means that the uh, header bears the cookie or holds the cookie if you will okay so a bunch of different examples of cookies they're using this value of 900,000 several times I think they're in the they are. You are correct about that. Um, so, yeah, getting that calculated into minutes and hours. A lot of times you see this in some sort of calculation, like max age is some sort of calculation because you want to calculate, you know, the number of hours. So yeah. a thousand times, so a thousand milliseconds is one second times 60 seconds times 60 minutes times three days or whatever or you just put a big number uh, that you calculate on your own. Okay, um, why don't you guys take a break? All right, so uh, just as a review, how do we create a cookie? It's done with res.cookie, kind of built into Express. How do we delete a cookie? Is what's next is res.clearcookie, and then you give it the name. When you create a cookie, you give it a name, 
When you delete a cookie, you clear it by its name. So if we created one called theme, clear cookie, passing it the name of our cookie, is all that's needed to clear it, delete it from the server. Now, a client can also delete a cookie, and I think you guys know how to do that from the client side, but this is obviously deleting it from the server side. Therefore, if you have a cookie that's, you know, an authentication cookie, you can you can delete that from the server side as well. Yes? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So you can give a cookie an ID. Yes. Uh, and kind of looking forward into sessions, when we talk about, uh, there's a package called Express Session. And this one, um, Express Session will create cookies for you and those cookies will have unique IDs. And the reason I show this is that this is used uh, uh, So uh, you can make your own authentication system. You can make your own login system, and we're going to do that here. We're going to make our own. Um, probably my understanding is the most popular pre-built authentication system is called Passport. And I'll show you how to use Passport. Um, what's great about Passport is that you've all seen this. How do you log in with Facebook? How do you log in with Google? You know, if you're making a real website that's going to, you know, have some standard features, you know, being able to log in with these things here with Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Um, anyways, all that just to say, Passport uses Express Session. Express Session builds cookies for you, and those cookies have IDs, and that's how you keep track of an individual session. Did I answer your question there? Probably more more than you needed. Yes, you can generate unique IDs. And I talked about reading cookies. Um, and I talked about it a, a little bit before break, a different way of reading cookies, but, but it's actually here. If a cookie, you can exist dot notation by its name rec.cookies.name, so dot notation, and read a cookie um, right from Express that away. So it's easy to it's easy to create a cookie. It's easy to read a cookie. It's easy to delete a cookie. CRUD operations, if you will. Again, highlight the overviews of cookies. They are stored on the client, um, and they are sent back to the server on every request. The problems with them is that they're not secure, uh, meaning you can have these man in the middle or uh, um, you know attacks. So they can be hijacked by uh, uh, X cross site scripting, or known as XSS, um, basically um, reading other websites, reading your cookies. Large cookies can slow down the user experience. So cookies, again, I kind of mentioned, uh, four thousand ninety six bytes, four K, if you will. Is four K a large file by today's standards? No. Right. So now, is that a large text file? Yeah. Yeah. It could store a decent amount of information in pure text, um, but it's 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 kind of limiting. Um, the another kind of more modern cookie, you know, and you guys have worked with local storage in JavaScript. So the local storage 
um, does not have that same limitation that cookies have. In the file size, you can store a lot more data on the client with local storage. Okay. Um, so there you go. Okay, moving on to encryption. So cookies by themselves are not secure, so we're gonna learn a technique to secure them. Um, you know, what is encryption by itself? Here we can read the definition. Encryption is the method by which information is converted into a secret code that hides the information's true meaning. Uh, I took a security class a long time ago and you kind of learn like the earliest forms of encryption uh, were, um, you know, uh, oh, like the old days of like the Roman Empire, they would send messengers from one, one village to the next and they couldn't just send a, a written message because then someone would intercept the written message and kill the messenger and they would have the written message. So they had to make some sort of cipher, cipher thank you, to kind of encrypt that message and decrypt that message. Um, so encryption goes back way past, you know, way before computers. Um, but, you know, all we did is we took computer algorithms and now we can cipher plain text. Cipher is kind of encoding a plain text message into something that you can't understand. Cipher text. Okay, so uh, computers use algorithms or ciphers um, for... For doing that and there's very common uh, encryption algorithms uh, just to name them right there's MD5 hash if you guys have heard of the MD5 hash there's a uh, SHA-256 uh, SHA-1 is SHA version 1 as uh, 160 bit encryption and then the more common is SHA-2 um, And so these are just different algorithms, if you will, will that'll take a plain text message and encrypt it into ciphertext, something that you, a human eye cannot understand. Okay, so there's a bunch of different definitions in there that we just kind of talked about. Um, when it comes to encryption, there's typically what's known as symmetric key encryption, where you have the same algorithm that encrypts and decrypts that's referred to as symmetric there's asymmetric which is called public and private key uh, much more common is asymmetric you've got one key that can encrypt another key that can decrypt and then all those encryption algorithms i was talking about those are referred to as hashing algorithms the md5 is a hash the sha1 and sha2 these are referred to as hashing algorithms that will take a piece of plain text into a hashed piece of text. Again, the hash being the cipher text. Um, when it comes to encryption, different ways that you can encrypt data. You can encrypt the data going across the internet with uh, SSL. Uh, we're going to talk about that just briefly. You're going to need a certificate to do that. Um, so you can encrypt the protocol right so http is the protocol you can hash a password you guys have seen a demonstration of that using uh, bcrypt you can also uh, hash uh, or perform authentication uh, with jwt tokens right so these are three different ways you can encrypt data to secure your application. You can encrypt the protocol, you can hash the password, and you can use JWT tokens, which we're gonna explore those in a little bit more detail. HTTP, by default, uh, has no encryption. And you guys have learned this, never use um, a banking website without that little lock or the HTTPS. Uh, don't buy something without that little lock or HTTPS. So um, basically to get HTTP into HTTPS, you have to apply what's referred to as SSL. SSL is a layer of security, secure sockets layer, um, that basically performs 
um, some security for you. And this is done with, oh, by the way, here's, you guys know this, right? Uh, a website without HTTPS says not secure, one with one. It'll give you the green lock and say secure. In order, you might have wondered this, like I, I know at some point I wanted to know how do I get HTTPS on my website? Like that's a um, very common question. And that is done with what is referred to as certificates. I think of certificates as a driver's license for a web server, right? In order to prove that the web server is who it says it is, uh, you typically pay for a certificate. Um, and so you can kind of see here, signed certificates are, you know, again, I think of them as driver's license for your web server. Signed certificates are issued to register domains and cost an annual fee. So there is a cost prohibitor here, um, you know, which is kind of prohibitive for you guys in school, um, you know, to put SSL on your domain, there would be a cost associated with it. So we don't do a ton of it, um, but you basically have to buy a certificate from what's referred to as a certificate authority. And so whenever you buy your domain, be it on GoDaddy, you know, you can, you can buy a certificate from GoDaddy or whoever you buy your domain from. And so there's a process to follow that verifies that you are the owner, that your web server belongs at this IP address. Um, and it is the certificate authority that gives you the public and private keys to enable SSL. Okay, so like the, the top level, the high level version of SSL is it costs money, you register for it, you have to pay for it. Whenever you buy a domain, you are able to purchase uh, from a certificate authority uh, these keys to encrypt the protocol, to encrypt HTTP. Um, and what does that kind of prevent you from doing? Well, it prevents some other web server from acting as if they are your domain uh, because they do not have that proven driver's license, that, that, that certificate. Okay, for testing, you can get self-signed certificates. So as you're in development, this would be considered something that's not cost prohibitive. We can go to OpenSSL and use um, kind of like fake HTTPS for testing purposes, but to get the real thing on a live domain, you gotta, you gotta pay for it. So OpenSSL kind of, again, certificates can be self-signed to facilitate testing. And again, because of that, we're not really gonna hit too much of HTTPS uh, today. All right, what else? So again, encrypting the protocol with HTTPS, that's done with certificates. We can also hash our passwords. I think you guys have seen this. Has everyone watched or at least done this by now? Yeah. Um, Bcrypt is a uh, dependency. You can install Bcrypt and then you have access to its methods to encrypt your passwords, take a plain text password and encrypt it. And then you're saving encrypted passwords in the database. And then there's a compare method. Um, so if we kind of look here, now this is the callback version of, of the method, bcrypt hash. We'll take a plain text password and what's referred to as a salt round. Um, just think of that as a layer of security to take your plain text password and apply some long string of characters after it so that when you hash it, um, it's more secure. Um, because if you, pa if you hash one, two, three, four, five, six, every time the resulting hash is the same thing. So just, so just hashing a plain text password by itself uh, is not considered pretty secure because users are always hashing the same passwords. So you wanna hash a typical password with uh, a random string of text, which is referred to as a salt round. It's like, here's, an, here's like 50 characters random that'll take a 
use our generic password and make it more secure. So Assault Round just makes that password more secure. Again, this is the callback version of it. Um, we like the the async version of it, right? This is much cleaner, um, where we are async and awaiting. We're taking the clear text password, and we are um, doing a default round. It's by default salt rounds is ten. That's just safe number to say do ten salt rounds, uh, which is the default value there. Um, you can make it more secure by increasing that number, but just realize that that slows down performance. So it's, it comes as a trade-off. Um, and then comparing passwords, right? Um, and so we will use this async of wait. So this is how we can encrypt the protocol. This is how we can encrypt our passwords. And last but not least, we want to encrypt the data being sent back and forth between the client and server with JSON web tokens to kind of jump ahead in my slides. JWT.io is the homepage uh, for JSON web tokens. And what's kind of cool, as we jump into what is a JSON web token, it's kind of broken down into three pieces, um, which is a header, kind of like the first portion before the dot. This is the encrypted header. And you can take a JSON web token, which is this is a JSON web token, an encrypted JSON web token, and you can paste your JSON web token in here and it will decrypt it for you. It'll give you, it'll give you the header, the payload is in purple, and then a, a signature um, to verify that the data has not, the payload has not been tampered. Okay, this is great. Um, this signature, I, I love, I love uh, hashing um, algorithms because if you guys have ever played the game of telephone, um, you know, you know how this works, right? If I were to come over here to Kiernan and tell Kiernan a message, and then you played this in kindergarten, right? Yeah. And then we just all send the message through the room, right? By the time it ends up at Dominic, that message has changed. Okay. So what a signature is? A signature is a algorithm to verify that whatever the payload is, whatever the message is, that when the client, be it Kiernan, and the server receives the message from the client, that the payload hasn't changed. You can use math to verify that the payload has never changed. Okay, so, so what is a JSON web token? A JSON web token is encryption for our cookies. Okay, cookies are not secure. It's done with a hashing encryption. Hashing encryptions have what's referred to as a signature. That signature is basically verifying that the payload, the data between point A and point B has never been tampered with. Um, so, so yeah, uh, JSON web tokens, we're gonna, we're gonna take our cookies, we're gonna package them up in a JSON web token and, and hash you know, hash that JSON web token and let's see what that looks like. Okay, JSON web token is a secure mechanism to give authentication tokens, um, which can be used to prove a user's identity. If we could just use a cookie, we would, but cookies are not secure. So a lot of times you can just, and you, you know exactly where this came from. This came from uh, the website, right? Um, the homepage. And understanding that it's using a SHA-2, or SHA-256 as it's often called, and that this is a JWT token. So in the header, that's the information that's there. Then you have a payload, which is the, the data itself. And then you've got a, a signature that 
is generated by the by the software to verify that the data has not been tampered with. So JSON Web Token is a uh, dependency. We'll install it with npm install JSON Web Token. And so we can kind of break it down, right? So we're going to use the updated syntax for this, but we're going to bring in JSON Web Token. Our payload is just a JavaScript object that says foobar. There's a secret. Your secret um, is kind of going to be what's used to generate that signature, right? Secrets are obviously kind of like passwords. You want to keep them, as the name implies, a secret. So since this is just for demonstration, our secret is shush and uh, we are generating a json web token using the jwt.sign so we're bringing in jwt it's an object that object has a sign method to that sign method we're passing two parameters the payload and a secret this is how we're going to generate our json web token this is the simplest example of how to create a json web token so big picture we're generating a cookie that cookie is in our payload you know, um, and save that cookie into the JSON web token is what we're going to basically do tomorrow. Here's kind of the same difference, but this, um, your web, your JWT tokens also have expiration uh, timers on them. Um, so, you know, your cookie and your JWT can be set to the same ex expiration that they don't have to be but it makes sense to me that they would and if the jwt.sign method is creating the web token uh, you can use a verify on the server right to receive that back from the client so here is how we can read our payload uh, out of that token. So here's the name is token, right? So this is the name of our variable, and therefore this would be used to read that variable on, on our Express server. Says generally we will send back this JSON web token as a cookie so that it can be stored for later use. Okay, so uh, that's kind of uh, that's the end of the theory portion. Um, you know, hit hit some big topics here um, that should enable us to at least get to get started on our next lab. So let's take a look at that lab. Okay, so just kind of looking at at this, we're not quite ready, I don't think, until we get into some of the code demonstrations tomorrow, um, because we're going to be I'm going to be demonstrating JWT and cookies and all this fun stuff. But just kind of glancing ahead, of course, our users are, are going to need uh, hash passwords. So that that would be something that I showed you how to bring in, but it wasn't graded until now. So our new users should have hash passwords. Um, and then we should use that hash password to log in. 
I'm going to show you how to create an edits collection so that now as any time a new operation happens on any of our collections, like if we add a user, we edit a user, we delete, um, if we delete a, uh, a bug, all records can be tracked using this edits collection. So I, I have to show you how to do that. Um, here you can see we're going to show when a user logs in, we generate a web token and store it as a cookie. I think I was saying that backwards earlier. Um, so that's new. This is a new route for our users where you can get to a, um, by the way, this is all users. This has been updated to those routes. I think you guys are familiar with that. Um, but anyways, this this uh, this users me route. You guys have all been to websites where you have your own like account information. The the users me will just get the logged in user and just give you your information, your username, your profile picture, you know, your street address. This is a new route that we haven't done yet. Get a user by ID, uh, updating the me route. So if you update the me route, you're probably gonna generate a new cookie and add a record to the edits collection. Same thing here, if you update a user, we're gonna kind of refresh that cookie information that we were talking about earlier. If we delete a user, get all these URLs updated. This is a post. So a lot of these are just um, doing this edit collection. Again, this is a new collection that we ha we don't have on our UML diagram yet. Um, we're gonna be locking this down a little bit. Send back a 401 error message if the user's not log uh, logged in. So here, can you, can you list your comments if you're not logged in? Right, so you get a 401 that you're not authenticated if the user is not logged in. Right, so part of this is locking down our routes so that you have to be logged in to access them. And that's going to come in the uh, Um, bugs, tests, there we go, bugs, tests, okay. Okay, so this is the lab at hand. I realize you can't do all of it. You can probably start doing some of it, like the user's me route, getting the things encrypted, getting the passwords encrypted and logging in. So I think you can get started on it. Definitely you can install the dependencies on your Express server. Um... Right now, hang tight on this requirement. I'm not sure that I'm gonna use that or not. We'll see how I code it tomorrow. Okay, so hold off on this middleware module for now and we'll see. Um, if I, we'll see how I code that tomorrow. If I do it the same way as I've done in the past. All right, so I'll let you guys, we basically got an hour and a half. You can get started on this lab. I realize you can't do it all right now, but you can get a start on it. And then tomorrow we'll do a little bit more coding along and then you should be pretty well prepared to, to do this.